10 Fascinating Facts About Life as a Medieval Monk Imagine the scenario. It is the year 1348. You are a rural peasant, born into a life of unimaginable hardship. All around you, serfs toil tirelessly from sunrise to sunset, working the land owned by their feudal lord in order to fulfill their heavy obligations. Your greatest aspiration is for your small business as a basket weaver to flourish enough to secure you a modest plot of land, which could sustain you in your old age. However, the worst outcome you could anticipate is a life of exhausting physical labor, a diet lacking in meat, and the possibility of an untimely death due to childbirth or the plague. Given these circumstances, would you be enticed to take religious vows and become a monk? If so, continue reading, as there was much more to the life of a monk than just a peculiar haircut. Number 10. The Silly Haircut Ah, yes, that distinctive haircut. The one with the bowl shape and the circular bald patch on top. This unique style, known as a tonsure, was achieved by shaving the middle section of the hair and trimming the rest. It held significant spiritual meaning for the monks who embraced it. The tonsure hairstyle symbolized the monk's dedication to Christ. There are a few conflicting theories regarding why only a portion of the head was shaved. Some believe that the remaining circle of hair represented the crown of thorns worn by Jesus during his crucifixion. Others suggest that this practice originated during the Crusades, as Christians sought to distinguish themselves from Muslims who ritually shaved their heads after visiting Mecca. Regardless of its origins, monks proudly sported this haircut for many generations, spanning centuries. However, in 1973, Pope Paul VI abolished the tonsuring ceremony, leading to a decline in its popularity. Number 9. Home Sweet Home Monks enjoyed significantly better living conditions compared to peasants and serfs. While their bedrooms were essentially small cells with minimal furnishings such as straw, they had the privilege of having a roof over their heads and regular meals, which was more than what could be said for the general population. Many monasteries were grand and expansive complexes, constructed in the Gothic style, intended to showcase the wealth of the church and reflect the glory of God to the common people. It wouldn't have been a bad place to spend time. In England, there are records of monastic settlements dating back as early as AD 406. However, the monasteries in England met a sudden end in the 1530s during the reign of King Henry VIII. Frustrated by the need to seek the Pope's permission for a divorce, Henry VIII eradicated all traces of Catholicism from the land and declared the country Protestant. The monasteries were looted, and the riches were distributed among the wealthy. Number 8. Poverty, Chastity and Obedience Hmm. It's not the most appealing way of life, is it? A medieval monastery was a community of men who had renounced material possessions and chosen to live separately from society with like-minded individuals. They dedicated themselves to spiritual rather than physical pleasures. Consequently, they took vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience and were expected to live without material possessions and emotional ties to the outside world. These vows were based on the teachings of St. Benedict, who established the guidelines for an ideal monastic life as early as the 6th century. Of course, maintaining chastity was easily avoided if a, one was attracted to men and b, could find a willing, and discreet, partner within the monastery. For those fortunate individuals, life was probably quite enjoyable. Number 7. The Icon An essential aspect of monastic life revolved around the possession of an icon or sacred relic. This icon could be any object that people held in high regard and would eagerly visit, a fragment of the original cross on which Christ was crucified, for instance, or the remains of a saint. In the case of Turin, Italy, it was the shroud believed to have been worn by Jesus in his tomb. If fortunate, the relic held by your monastery would gain renown, attracting Christians from distant places who would embark on pilgrimages to witness it. This influx of visitors would bring much-needed economic activity to the local area and a significant increase in donations to your church. Number 6. SHHHHHH If a monk ever found himself experiencing a hint of boredom after joining a monastic order, he would not have been able to alleviate it by engaging in lively conversations with his fellow monks. 
monasteries were havens of tranquility, and as such, most of the tasks performed by monks were carried out in complete silence. They were even prohibited from conversing during meals. However, some monks found ways to circumvent the rule of silence by utilizing alternative means of communication. Sign language was employed during meal times when a monk wished to request food or drink. Additionally, some monks communicated secretly through whistling. These methods were often taught to young novices, teenage recruits learning the ways of monastic life, and oblates, children entrusted to the care of the monks. In this manner, the silent languages were passed down from one generation to the next. Number 5. Stand, Sit, Kneel, and Repeat Starting to perceive life as a monk as potentially dull? Well, you may be onto something. Fortunately, the monotony of performing charitable acts and maintaining perpetual silence was regularly interrupted by lengthy and intricate church services. Monks diligently attended a staggering eight services each day. They rose with the sun, making summers likely more challenging than winters, and engaged in various choral services such as matins, lauds, and Massachusetts. Additionally, they held a daily chapter, a formal gathering to discuss monastic affairs. All in all, a monk could anticipate spending up to 10 hours per day participating in church services. That's certainly a substantial amount of chanting. Number 4. More than meat free Fridays. Medieval society was characterized by strict regulations. England's sumptuary laws governed various aspects of behavior, not limited to just monks. These laws dictated the types of clothing and colors individuals were permitted to wear based on their social status, as well as the maximum prices that eateries could charge for food, monasteries, in general, were prosperous institutions, and despite the challenges of monastic life, monks could typically rely on regular and high-quality meals. However, according to the law, medieval people were obligated to observe three fasting days per week, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. They observed even more fasting days during religious observances like Lent. The term fast used in this context does not have its modern meaning. In those days, individuals were simply expected to refrain from consuming meat and dairy products, while fish and vegetables were still allowed. Interestingly, some monks found ways to circumvent this restriction by classifying certain meat items as fish. It is documented that beaver tails and rabbit fetuses were consumed during fasting periods. In France, a particular group of monks even resorted to eating local puffins. Number 3. The Arts We owe a great deal of gratitude to the monks who resided in monasteries. These monastic communities served as remarkable centers of learning, where monks and nuns dedicated significant time and effort to the preservation, copying, and creation of books and manuscripts. Thanks to their efforts, numerous works by renowned authors such as Cicero, Aristotle, and Virgil have survived. With the advantage of being literate and free from the constant struggle for sustenance, these men possessed both the time and the resources to produce magnificent works of art. The remnants of their imaginative talent can still be observed in the illuminated manuscripts and choral music composed during the Middle Ages. Interestingly, monasteries were often the sole repositories of books, as these items were highly valuable and costly. Consequently, it is no coincidence that monasteries were frequently targeted during Viking raids in Europe until the 11th century. While the monks themselves took vows of poverty, the institutions they belonged to were remarkably wealthy, and it appears that many were aware of this fact. Number 2. Jobs in addition to your daily obligations to church services, education, and acts of charity, you may also be assigned a specific role within the monastery. The highest ranking position, of course, was that of the abbot, and obtaining that role would require a stroke of great luck. The abbot primarily interacted with the outside world and represented the institution to the broader community. Following the chain of command, the prior supervised the monks and appointed individuals to various roles. The steward managed the monastery's finances, while the cellar oversaw the storage of food and beverages. The almoner was responsible for caring for the poor and needy in the surrounding community, and the cantor led the choir. The sacrist ensured the cleanliness of the church and the smooth running of services. Number 1. 
stylish attire. When one envisions a monk, the typical image that comes to mind is that of a man clad in brown robes, downing sandals and holding rosary beads. However, it is important to note that robes varied in color depending on the specific religious order one belonged to. For instance, members of the Benedictine order wore black robes, earning them the nickname the Black Monks. The Carthusian order, on the other hand, wore white robes. In Italy, the Capuchin friars sported brown robes with a distinctive long-pointed hood, and it is from these monks that the word cappuccino is derived.